Hey folks, and welcome to The Counter Clipping Show. I see that we have the little mini screen on, which I guess is fine, um, but I guess that's not exactly as intended. Let me fix that real quick. It is possible to fix that by just turning this thing off. There we go. That is better. And then I can turn this on too. Uh, that won't work. Never mind. All right. So off we go to the races. Here is Connor Clipping show number 81, which was supposed to be last week. I trust you'll all be aware of the, uh, the disgraceful internet service provided by breeze line. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how that got resolved. Uh, the topic of the week is complexity in wargaming, and this is a thing that was, it's a thing that I talk about kind of a lot, and it was brought to the fore again by Harold Buchanan's post on Twitter that kind of blew up, um, I think maybe in ways not necessarily intended by Harold, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. There is a GMT Games shipping update, which unfortunately I have had to cancel my three things on that because the timing is just going to be really bad. Um, I don't really have house news, so uh, I, won't, I, mean, I guess we'll talk at least a little bit about that. I mean, I just we're, I'm in this foot tapping stage where we don't really know anything yet. So let me get started. As soon as I get finished punching these Russians out of the sheet here, we are still clipping Balance of Powers. We are still drinking the Singleton of Glendulin, which is without water at this moment. And which is pretty okay without water. Um, to be honest, you can put water in it, won't, won't hurt it, but it's bottled at 40%. So you, as is often the case, you don't have to. So let's get started by saying hello to Wade Moore, Mike Anthony, John C. from the sunny Philippines. Rick Cox, Tom D., Joe Okabayashi, Stigler is in the house. Charles Latora, Tom D, Ken X or Ken 10, Emir Garcia, welcome to the channel. Daniel Silverthorne, Manders, John Nolan, Marty Sample is in the house from sunny New England, wherever he's at. Fast Hines, Jason W, Vince Ree, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm backed up already here. Patrick of Patrick's Tactics and Tutorials, John Longshore, Joe Perez, Michael Head. John Nolan, if I haven't gotten you already, Andrew Franca, David Imperato, Farshad Niazi, uh, Husa Maldonado, Christopher Prest, Fucko is in the house, Doug Blayart messing up rules. Uh, I think I got everybody there. And we do have Michael Mellon, Jeff Talor, Achilles, uh, Tom Hall, Missing Seattle, Sergeant Deadhead, Dave1013, welcome back, Matt Davidson, Alan Salazar, Vince C, if I didn't get you already, and I don't think I did. So we do have some shipping news uh, from a couple of places. One is that, let me get this out of the way first. Uh, one piece of news is that uh, the new printing, second printing of Deadly Northern Lights from Thin Red Line Games is now hit DEFCON 1. It's their uh, rather theatrical way to say it's now shipping. Uh, it took a while for them to hit this point for some reason, and we think it was because of logistics delays with U.S. Customs, but, you know, you never know. Um, that is still a bit messed up. So if for those of you who haven't ordered that and you want it, and it is, and I, I mean, for me, it's not really an option to order it right now anyway, because the timing would be horrific, but... Um, it, and it's expensive, but if you do want it, it is a significant upgrade from the original printing. Uh, there won't be an upgrade kit from what I understand. And if you want it, best to get your inquiries in over there right now. So head on over to Thin Red Line Games' website because you're probably, they're, they're, they tend to evaporate within a matter of days or hours um, upon release. So, and they, they may already have been all sold out for all, for all I know. Like I said, for me, the timing was just exceptionally bad on this, but I wasn't really, I mean, I have the old one. I wasn't really planning on ordering the new one anyway. So one of my objectives is to get that thing, or one of those games, at least to the table at some reasonably 
soon point. GMT Games has announced that next Friday, July 15th, which is now this Friday, they will be charging for Great Battle to Julius Caesar, the Musket and Pike Dual Pack, uh, the Salerno Mounted Map, and the Stalingrad 42 expansion. Uh, so I had ordered three of those things, th two full games, and, well, really, I mean, Great Battles of Julius Caesar is kind of two or three games, and Musket and Pike Dual Pack is kind of two full games. Um, and the Stalingrad 42 expansion was just an expansion. But right now, the timing is just really bad. Uh, I, I don't want to spend, I mean, I'm, I'm like, you know, canceling Paramount Plus, right? Because I don't want to spend the, the 15 bucks, um, let alone because uh, I, I I still don't know exactly what our closing costs are going to be. And I know our, our ability to pay the closing costs is going to be, I, we should be cool, um, but it's going to be really close. And I don't want to jeopardize that because that's more important. I will order all this stuff at full price if need be later on. Uh, but that won't, it won't really come to that because I can get it at a discount, decent discount from place like Miniature Market or, or whoever. So um So we were back online as of Tuesday last week, if you didn't see the show with Dan. And I made the video, I think on Friday, I think is when that video went up, something like that, uh, of me ranting. And that's that's what I was told it was, was a big rant. Uh, and that's not wrong <laughs> um, about Breeze Line and how terrible they are. And I still think they're pretty terrible. Um, I got action by looking up the vice president of customer solutions, customer support from BreezeLine and messaging them directly on LinkedIn with a rather, rather long spiel, uh, but polite. Uh, but I'm like, hey, here's the story. Here's what's going on, man. This is not really OK. And they got somebody to to, to step in and, and do some stuff that, that resolved the problem. Now, they did end up sending somebody out on the 7th, which was a couple of days later. But by that point, they had already managed to resolve the problem. I was back online by that point, which means that they got somebody in the office to flip a digital switch somewhere and they got it working, which means that had they had a real escalation process of Okay, here's tier one tech support. They can't fix it. Send it up to tier two. Okay, tier two can't fix it. Here, send it up to tier three. They'd have eventually reached somebody that would figure it have figured it out, but they don't. They have a person that will apologize to you uh, and schedule an appointment for somebody to come out in approximately two weeks to fix your internet. Um, and at this point, uh, the um. I, I mean, I was not even mad at that point anymore by the time I actually started talking directly to them. Uh, I, I had already, and I took like a Sunday and Monday off, right, of, of howling at them because I, I had done it enough, right? Uh, they were certainly working those days. They were answering the phone, but good luck. I mean, they had two or three people answering the phone for the entire planet, so good luck. Um, somebody mentioned that you can get a lot faster customer service at a lot of places if you speak Spanish and you, uh, you know, you click on the Habla Espanol, uh, switch when that you first call in, but I haven't tried that and my Spanish is super duper rusty. So we didn't actually try to do that. So, um, yes. And do like the video before we, before we, we move on here. I think I've, I've gotten at, at this point. Let, let's pretend that I have ranted for another half an hour about Breeze Line and how terrible they are um, and just move on because we do, you, you can go watch the video from last week. It, it's not, I'm not, I don't go that bananas in it, but I, it has been described, I think, with some justification as a rant. So, uh, so you know, I, I've done it enough. I've done it to people at work. You know, WOW was a major internet service provider here in central Ohio. I'm telling people who are wow customers who are now on breeze line man you don't have to leave right now but have a backup plan know who your your backup internet service provider is and, and just just call them when breeze line st sticks it in your ass instead so um internet service in the united states is kind of a joke anyway i mean you you go to any almost any other country and it's not a monopoly um, I don't want to say almost any other country, but, uh, but, but I mean, even in like, uh, you know, 
uh, Singapore, right? They, all the cars they have Wi-Fi in them. Um, we we don't have that. That's not that's not common here at all, right? Um, they have much faster internet service, and it's much cheaper. And it's because, generally speaking, there is competition, which is not normally the case. Uh, with American internet service providers. Generally, you have a very limited selection of providers that you can go with based on who has who controls the wiring in your area. Uh, you might only have one option, and it might, might be satellite, which is normally not very good, although maybe it's better now than it used to be. I don't know. It's not, not something that I've ever really dealt with, uh, nor do I wish to. So... Um, house news. We are, I think, out of underwriting and into conditional approval. Um, so I think that's good, but I still don't have like the final word of when closing is going to be or what closing costs are going to be. Um, and so I'm kind of, I, I am in the, like I said before, we're in the kind of, we're just tapping our feet here, waiting for news and we we have no ability to affect that process, uh, whatsoever. So, uh, it's, I find this part of the process to be incredibly stressful because there's nothing for me to do about it, right? All I can do is is sit here and sweat it out. Um, and that's irritating. So, so we will talk a little bit about elegance. I think that is, it, it, at least to some extent, a subjective uh, question. Uh, but we will indeed do that. So Stigler says complexity has a lot of bearing on his current product project. Um, so we'll see. I, I mean, I got opinions on this. I've had opinions on this for a long time. Um, but the we'll, we'll, let me get caught up on the comments. So as Fucko here mentions, Delhi Northern Lights was released for pre-orders today. Uh, new Legion game, Fire on the Mountain. That is, I'm aware of it, but I don't remember what it is about. So... Uh, I am, you know, be happy to take a look at it next time I go to Legion Games website, uh, which isn't going to be too long. Uh, apparently, it's a South Mountain. Okay, we have two games on South Mount. I actually only have one game on South Mountain, and it is uh, Twin Peaks from GMT. I do not have the South Mountain game from MMP. Um, that is a uh, regimental subseries, I believe, and the the progenitor of the line of battle series so um so yes dirk plexiglass fine name you got there dirk welcome to the channel and let me mention you know yes thumbs up the video uh, subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already i do have alerts on so if somebody subscribes while we're while we're streaming here we, i should get something but uh let me make sure the audio is audio is actually not on now I take that back. It is on, which means I need to plug these in. So, Vishka, Toasty Phoenix. I can imagine that it is, in fact, extremely toasty. So, uh, who says that complex? Ah, uh, here, here we go. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about this. Um, I in in short, I don't agree with this statement. Um, I think, well, we'll we'll get to that. Let me get caught up on the comments here, which we're almost we're almost caught up. Kyle Reese, we're glad you can make it tonight as well. Test of Faith has arrived for uh, folks, or is beginning to arrive at least for folks who ordered it from Compass. Uh, that is the uh, latest Adam Stark weather. Ah, very good. Very good. So uh, Marty has subscribed. Marty, you weren't subscribed to the channel or did you unsubscribe and resubscribe? Um, if I'm very disappointed if, if that's what happened. Well, unless, unless you just unsubscribed and resubscribed to experiment with it. So, which is the, which is fine. So test of faith is, uh, the OSS game on the Arab Israeli wars. So, or the 73, I think, uh, Arab Israeli War, at least. That is a topic that I have expressed zero interest in over the years, um, and I'm I'm sticking to that position at least at the moment. Um, right now, I mean, it's not like I can I have the 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 leverage to buy something like that right now. Anyway, so where'd the boats go? These are the Russians, so there's really not going to be very many boats. 
So the He-Man Word Camp Gamer Gatekeepers Club. I don't think that anybody sets out to to be a gatekeeper, right? Um, I think uh, Marty just just uh, just the Akron area is the is the plan, uh, and that is the current plan. So. Well, we we're in late stage capitalism here, Jason W. So we have uh, we have not enforced the Sherman Antitrust Act in decades. So So, I mean, here, here, I mean, we have a lot of open country here in the United States and, you know, here in Ohio too. Uh, so there's a lot of places in Ohio where uh, you don't have much of a choice of internet service provider. So the choice where we're moving is, or where we hope to be moving, fingers crossed, is um, the only good alternative with spectrum uh other uh, other options were things like uh, earthlink and that kind of stuff and it's like man these are really not good uh good service packages so we're we're gonna go with spectrum instead um and probably get our phones through spectrum as well because we're due for new phones it's obviously not something i want to buy now um i obviously you know have to consider that carefully because i do a lot of filming for the channel using my phone so uh, so that is a consideration. But apparently, the the upgrade, the current upgrade through Samsung, is uh, uh, definitely a phone upgrade or for phone camera upgrade. So that will be okay. Um, but their uh, Spectrum uses Spectrum mobile service uses Verizon's network. Only it costs like a quarter of what Verizon costs. So it's going to be a lot cheaper, um, I think, but that is not a that is not a shift we're making right now. I will wait till after after we move for that. So, so I got the storage container today. By the way, the uh, the drop it in your your driveway and load it up container. Um, so we will, you know, I'm looking forward to actually moving forward on this process. Let me put it that way. Uh, this is, yeah, I don't know, Tom, if you're, if you're, like I said earlier, if you are, this is second printing of deadly Northern lights. If you are interested in it, hop over there right now and, and order it because I don't believe that they will last very long because they haven't in the past. So barbarians at the gates actually looks really, really good. Uh, so fantastic. Uh, GT pony rider says barbarians at the gates looks good. It looked really good to me too, actually. So I'm, I'm glad that you are also happy with it. Uh, Jeff Beeler mentions uh, when designers handle complexity by designing for effect, Simonich and Danny Parker do this. Uh, well, yeah, it's harder with Europa, but I mean, those are not the first designers that, that spring to mind for me when we start talking about design for effect. Dean Essig is, actually. So, all right, let's uh, move online. So, as Greg mentions here, uh, Thin Red Line Games does have a, 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 a pre-order process that probably wouldn't work at a larger scale than they, than they operate at. They're only printing like a couple of hundred copies at a time. Um, and which explains the prices, right? I mean, they're they're pretty expensive games. They're big games, right? You're not getting a you're not getting a little mini game for your two hundred dollars, but but you're spending after shipping something like two hundred dollars, um, uh, and the production values are, are very high. They're they're really nice. Um, so if physical component quality is uh, a question for you. I don't believe you'll be particularly disappointed by Thin Red Line games unless you're one of those lunatics that thinks all maps should be mounted regardless of whether there's five or six maps in the game or not. Um, I don't think that is a reasonable uh, a, a reasonable statement. Um, I'm aware that there is at least one game with six mounted maps in it, but uh, that's those but but Harry is crazy. So that that whiff got designed like that. So or the latest edition of whiff got produced like that, I should say. So 
I hit was on Time Warner Cable, which which turned into Spectrum at one point uh, for a long time and was perfectly happy with them. But I had some bad customer service. I had some bad, I, I'd say, local support experiences with Time Warner service. Um, it, it can't be as bad as as what we have now with, I mean, if I've called Spectrum, and I've called them about five times, right, in the last couple of weeks. Um I've gotten to talk to somebody in within a minute or two, as opposed to waiting 45 minutes on the phone. So it has in no sense been as terrible as Breeze Line, uh, which is flaming garbage. Uh, the biggest pods that I can could find are 16 feet long, 16 by about eight, maybe something like that. Uh, they actually had a, a robot that steered the thing into my driveway, which was neat. I hadn't expected that. Um. So, I mean, even a two-mounted map game is, I think, unreasonable, to be honest. Um, there's people that say, you know, hey, this game with two maps, I, I, I expected mounted maps. I'm like, really? Did you really? I don't think that's a reasonable expectation um, for a game with two maps. Um, any multi-map game, assuming they're standard size maps... Uh, any multi-map game is really almost certainly going to be unmounted, and that's just the way it is. And honestly, that's probably, that's really fine, because the people who are playing those games are going to play them under Plexi anyway. Uh, Ted Racer is, uh, Ted may have gotten banned from Twitter, by the way. I'm not sure what's up with that. Um, I didn't see anything. I just noticed I can't find him anymore. Uh, so yes, he's very designed for effect. And all these, all the gentlemen who have been mentioned have been, speaking of gentlemen, I got to get to that too, um, uh, have used the design for effect technique. Um, so one of the, I've already, I'm already packing stuff, right? I've got, I may have mentioned this. I've got about 40 boxes or 45 boxes of war games packed up. Um, so I have been looking on eBay for, spare war in the pacific counter sheets for about two years pretty much since i got my copy of war in the pacific and it was missing a counter it is otherwise unpunched it's got a it's got a reasonably crummy box and it's missing this one miscellaneous japanese brigade infantry brigade uh, but other than that it's in great shape and i want to play it so uh i've been looking for loose counter sheets and to no avail whatsoever and uh, somebody on Facebook had a just big bag of War in the Pacific counters. It was not a complete set or anything like that. And he said, hey, anybody missing anything? And I'm like, yes, yes, I'm missing something. So he sent me my one counter. So thanks. Uh, I don't want to mention any names, but uh, but thank you for sending. I mean, I, I gave him a couple bucks uh, for his trouble. But uh, so thank you for for providing that one Japanese brigade so that the game is now complete. And at least I can feel better about saying the game is now complete. We may actually be clipping that in a future counter clipping show, believe it or not. Um, OK, so. Uh, Christopher mentions just a guard's video on Warsaw 1920. Supplier will seem to bring out some great decision making. So, this is a topic that has come up a lot in role playing games as well. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna use some references here from role playing games, but but they're just gonna kind of slip in. The same stuff applies to war games as well. What's the most popular traditional war game that you can think of? Like traditional hex encounter it doesn't have to be hex encounter per se, but traditional war game played by war game people. What's the most? What's the most played one? I think the answer is probably ASL. Okay, um, and because a game like Twilight Struggle is not a uh, traditional war game, right? And yet ASL is monumentally complex. When we start to look at the, the games that we see getting played in the hobby, they will, as they do in role-playing games, they will tend to be complex games. Yes, ASL is kind of a lifestyle game, but so is D&D. And, and most versions of D&D are not particularly simple. Um, uh, D&D, you know, the, the 
so it, it, it being a lifestyle game is kind of a, it, beside the point, right? Um, it's it's really complicated, but it's also really popular. Now, I'm not supposing that it's popular because it's complicated, but it does tell us that a game can still attract a large audience whilst being a complicated game, right? Um, and if you look at, uh, you know, OCS, right? If you go to Console World Expo and see big footprint games, right? How many of those big footprint games, how many of those people playing games at MonsterCon, how many of those games are simple games, right? Even the ones that are simple monsters are always qualified as saying they're simple monsters. Now, I'm not pretending that monster game play is necessarily equivalent to just every historical gameplay, right? Um, my point is that while there might be people to whom the complexity is a barrier, I think that number is smaller than is supposed. And I think there is actual evidence to support that statement. And there really isn't any evidence to support the idea that everybody stays away from complicated games because they're complicated games. Um, where are the Austrians? The Austrians are a lurid pink in this game, which is an interesting stylistic choice, let's say. So there is basically no <laughs> Russian naval. This in mines. Uh, but that's about it. And, and furthermore, uh, I, I kind of feel like we're, we're, to some extent, asking the wrong questions when we talk about complexity in terms of barriers to, to getting people into wargaming. Um, because last year at, or at Origins, and, and this isn't to say that this is data, right? This is just an anecdote. Uh, so last year at Origins, I ran Commands and Colors Napoleonics. Last year, or, yeah. Now, last year at Origins was a weird year too, right? It was in October, and it was about half the number of people, and uh, it was a little, little over half the number of people this time, I think. Um, but you know, and yes, some people walked by, and and a couple of the people that actually played the game were were and asked questions about it, uh, and a couple of people played the game who were not like war regular war gamers. Um, but uh, I had more people walk walk up and say wow look at this what's this all about uh with europa right and we had a bunch of people come and see, we were really depending on on this actually that people would come down and sit down with us and play this crazily complicated game i mean we simplified it a little bit for the sake of, of it being an open game at a convention but um the uh uh, the, the point is that it was not necessarily a turnoff to people. And at least one of those people who sat down and played a turn with us was also not a war gamer. I mean, admittedly, she was retired Air Force. So it wasn't like she'd never heard of war gaming before, but uh, it was, you know, but not an experienced war gamer nonetheless. Um, I think nonetheless that what we're, what we are often confusing with, complexity being a barrier to getting people into role playing is in fact just bad presentation bad rule books for example i mean we can all name i'm not gonna i think probably Lira will stay away well i mean i can name an example that i've named many times before that original goss rule book is garbage man it's it's a bad rule book um sometimes the designer is it, no matter how brilliant the design is not the right guy to uh, to write the rule book or or gal I suppose, um, but uh, you know sometimes somebody uh, John Zisner from a uh, AEG I had a not not a, was it AEG I forget um, forget who who I had this conversation with years ago and he said the be the best lesson he ever learned was that at, at, when he designed something he doesn't want to write the rule book um, he wants to get somebody else to write the rule book. Um, because it will be a better rule book in that case. Um, and we can look at a lot of newer games with really good rule books or really good rules presentation, things like uh, Combat Commander, which whatever I, bad stuff I have to say about Combat Commander, everybody agrees that it has an amazingly well-written rule book. Um, so, 
you know, there, there's ways around this. And, and frankly, I think that's responsible for a, 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 some measure of the popularity of Combat Commander. Um, a really good rule book will help people get into it. Um, I don't think it's a prerequisite necessarily, because again, you know, how many people's first war game is, is there may, they may be gamers already, uh, but not necessarily war gamers. But how many people's first war game is ASL, right? Because they didn't learn it from the rule book. They learned it because they had friends who like ASL and, and taught it to them. Um, complexity is to some extent subjective. Um, when you try to quantify, you know what? I, I actually am going to back up on that. I don't think complexity is subjective. What it is, is it's difficult to quantify. It's difficult to say, you know, hey, th this, these are the, the metrics that we are using to decide uh, how complex a game is versus how simple this other game is. But I think we are, we can all generally agree that this game is complicated or that game is not complicated. And most of us have the perspective to be able to say, well, by my standards, that's not a particularly complicated game, right? Because they're used to more complicated games. Um, so there, there is some degree of, of subjectivity there, but I think it's more uh, just a difficulty in pinning it down quantitatively um, than it is that it is subjective like art might be subjective, where I might look at a piece of art and just not get it. Right. Um, and other people might look at a piece of art and say, oh, oh, hey, that's the Mona Lisa. Right. Um, I don't think that's necessarily. There's a root role playing game now, by the way. Uh, my joke, by the way, when this whole thing came up is that somewhere in the universe of euros, there's people complaining uh, that the, the, the euro people are gatekeeping because uh, their games are becoming too complicated. Uh, and and that conversation is almost certainly a thing that is happening tony from tony's board life welcome back to the scream as with scott bell also welcome back and one the one true phlegm and messing up rules looks like we've got a pretty good turnout tonight so world in flames is yeah world in flames is complicated it's not nearly as complicated as a world at war uh, but but those are the kind of of sort of dodgily quantitative statements we can make, right? About, you know, a world at war is more complicated than than World in Flames is. Um, that's true, but it's it, it it's not, it, it might appear to be qu a quantitative statement and it is not. Um, to ask, to answer Matt Davidson, first of all, Matt, welcome back. Uh, no, this is, there, there is a correlation between rules page count and complexity, but just because a game's got a high page count doesn't necessarily mean it's complex. Um, a, an example might be Atlantic Chase, which has a, a quite a high page count if you count all the different books, uh, but which is really not a very complicated game. Um, and of course, Jeff's right here, right? And and if if I was teaching somebody ASL, not that I'm in a position to do that, um, that's where I would start. I would start with basic infantry scenarios. We'd play a couple of those. Then we'd add a couple of guns, and then we'd add a couple of vehicles. And this is basically the same techniques that that the starter kit system used, except that the starter kit system leaves out a couple of additional mechanics that I think you could probably handle as long as you kind of limit exposure to them very early on. Those are bypass movement, concealment, and snipers. Those are the main things that um, that starter kit leaves out uh, as and actually concealment is now in the game uh as of starter kit number four so uh there is a difference between complexity and depth and depth is generally preferable over complexity i think i think that's true um when, when we start talking about depth we're talking john longshore thanks so much and uh, a reminder I, I always forget to mention this uh super chats and super stickers and all that those little buttons you can push and give me a couple bucks uh, are on. They are much appreciated and they will help to ensure that your comment gets noticed uh, because when we have 118 people in the stream, as we do right now, it is very easy for me to miss comments. So, so thank you, John. I, I do appreciate it. So uh, Tom MC. Uh, yes. So somebody looking for, a modern thir uh, 
third Reich, I mean, third Reich, remember the third Reich was considered really complicated when it came out. Right. So I, I think, I think that's less true now. I think the standard of complexity for, for at least traditional war games has gone up to the extent that, that, uh, a third Reich, which would have rated a nine or a 10 on Avalon Hills complexity scale back in the day is now like a seven, right? Um, there's definitely a cup, a couple of levels of more complicated games floating around than that. Um, at, at the top of which I think in that top tier of complex games, I think is a world at war, uh, which is not that, to say that a world at war isn't worth playing. Uh, there's people that love it and oh, those are tanks. Um, there's people that love it, um, and it's definitely learnable, right? People play it at WBC every year, um, but man, it's it. There's a lot there. It's it's really complicated, and the rule book is also, if we want to talk about barriers to, to getting people into war games, um, somebody that buys that thing cold, which is a bad idea, right? And I wouldn't recommend it if you don't have somebody, you know, uh, like war gamers around you that are already maybe you can sell on it. Uh, I'd strongly recommend against buying a World at War and trying to figure it out yourself from that rule book. That's that's going to it's probably possible, but man, that's a that's a bad learning experience in my opinion. Um so this can be an issue. Uh, it's definitely not an issue for me. I tend to come back to games I, I mean I tend to play series games where I can come back to the system, even if it's not the exact same game. Let me put it that way. Uh, there's something to this. I think I think you could, uh, if if one is to ask the statement that if can, could you write a, a really clear, easy rule book for Third Reich, the Avalon Hill Third Reich, right? Not the World at War. Uh, and I think the answer is yes. I think you could very readily come up with a better way to, to teach people that game than that rule book. This can happen too. Thanks, Ron, for stopping by. Um, this this can happen too. Uh, and designers have relatively little leverage in this in this hobby today. Um, and there is essentially nobody that is designing material internally anymore. So you, uh, you're, you're always talking about some kind of, you know, independent uh, or freelancing designer that has essentially no leverage or control over the development process. Um, or, or they have, they do it all themselves. Right. Um, so uh, you know, like John Butterfield, Achilles, thank you so much. Much appreciated for closing costs. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, he's curious as to how many people here played what we considered a complex game as their first game. So what was my first war game was, um, was paratroop, which I certainly wouldn't call a complicated game. I, in fact, it's, it's three games in one. So it's actually simpler than the, um, standard S and T game, which is in turn, not particularly complex normally. Uh, so definitely not me. Uh, in terms of role-playing games, my first role-playing game was D&D, &D, but it was Moldvay D&D, &D, which is pretty simple D&D. &D. Uh, I think even that simple D&D &D is a relatively complicated game. Um, I hope... Um, so... Oops, shit. John C. says he's getting hiccups. Uh, let me know if anybody else is having that problem. If, it, if, if everyone's having that problem, I'm blaming Breezeline. So... Unless the designer owns the company or unless it's like a John Butterfield situation where if John Butterfield designs a game and publishes it through Decision Games, it's a good game because John Butterfield made it a good game um, as opposed to going through the historically uh, troublesome, let's say, Decision Games development process. Uh, John Nolan, this is a great idea. I think where I'm at, I, I'm kind of my attention is a little too scattered to make this an effective technique. Um, but one can often leverage other people's effectively leveraged techniques, um, like Stuka Joe's uh, sequence of play cards, for example, which is a great idea, uh, which will will help people uh, learn a lot of different kinds of games. 
Um, depends on the game. Some games that's less useful, like a, like an uh, like a GCACW type of activation system, where the great majority uh, there's like an action phase or something like that, and the great majority of things that occur in the game occur in that phase that results in a sequence of play which does not really give you a particularly strong picture of what the overall play flow looks like. GTS is another example. There's like a couple of little maintenance phases and there's like a little maintenance phase at the end and everything else happens in this big action uh, or activation phase or how, whatever you're calling it um, that, you know, in which you draw chits or, or roll the dice or, or whatever. So this is a great idea. Um, and I would encourage people to do it. Um, oh, John's first game was 1776. I take it, John, that you mean the Avalon Hill 1776, which is a very good game, by the way. Um, I, I always thought it was a Mark McLaughlin game, and apparently that's not the case. So I think a fair number of people started with Squad Leader, right? Um, I mean, I bought the damn thing or got that, you know, with allowance money or whatever it was back in 84 or 85 or something like that. Oh, William Aarons, thank you so much. Isn't it a fact that some of the, this is not, uh, actually, this is sort of germane. Isn't it a fact that some of the greatest battles in history, such as Verdun or Kursk, had less complex strategies than sheer brute force and do games based on those campaigns reflect that reality? Sometimes they absolutely do. Um, I think the the brute force nature of combat on the east front is generally overstated however uh there's a lot of complex maneuver in that camp in that theater let's say rather than the campaign because it's many different campaigns over four years of war um and the Germans went, one of the reasons why the Germans hung on as long as they were was because they were better at that than the Russians were, than the Soviets were. Uh, but the Soviets had their share of successes too. So uh, we have this idea that, um, and I think to some extent, I'm, I'm going to say this, and I think the war gamers here will agree, but at the same time, there's still kind of an unconscious idea that the Russians are are achieving their their <coughs> their victories through mass uh, more than finesse and that's not necessarily true um and and i think most uh at least most good uh east front games will show that actually uh certainly ocs does um it is difficult uh to you you can't just it, you're you're leveraging different kinds of formations in ocs as the russians as the soviets i keep doing that um and then the russians go and screw everything up right now so i've got i gotta I keep calling them the soviets um, so you're, you're, you're leveraging different kinds of formations, right? As the Soviets versus as the Germans, uh, you're much more dependent on those infantry divisions, uh, but you still need the support from the, from the mobile formations as well. Um, there's a lot of learning tools for OCS and I, I know we, we have, I, I owe everybody a, a tutorial video, which again, we just haven't gotten finished yet. Right now, there's a whole lot going on. So it's not going to get finished this month. Let me put it that way. And I think we're now about a year late on it. Uh, Battles for the Ardennes. Yeah, a an SPI classic. Uh, reprinted by a TSR, too. So... Jeff Anderson, first of all, welcome to the stream. The first game was Avalon Hill's War and Peace, uh, which is also a great game. Actually, uh, one of the things I have out still is the new One Small Step version of War and Peace, which is very nice um, and isn't broken in any way that the original wasn't broken. Let me put it that way. The campaign game, I think, still looks very dodgy, uh, but the, the operational scenarios all look really good, so... Maybe we'll get that to a table uh, as well, since it's highly playable and uh, ready to go here. And that's got two mounted maps, uh, for that matter. But the the number of games with two mounted maps that I I, I can count them on like one hand. So I missed this, uh, John. Thank you so much. I have no idea <laughs> what the, what that is in local currency down in the Philippines, but thank you. Um, I hope that it's a, it is a lot of money. I see the number and I'm like. <gasps> And then I see, I see that it's John with 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 
not a, a different currency. So it's it's a little less exciting. But um, but thank you, thank you very much for the support and and for buying the shirts too. Um, so the the complexity of Pacific War is pretty high. It's not insanely high, um, but it's fairly high. Um, I would rate it on the GMT scale of one through nine. I would pro I think Mark put it, I mean, GMT will put it at whatever the designer says it is, right? And I think Mark says it's a nine. I'm not sure it's a nine. I think it's about a seven or an eight, a high seven or a low eight. However, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the organization of the rule book um, is not optimal. So, for example, depending on what kind of, like what kind of uh, fire, I'll, I'll call it fire, you're doing, right? Whether it's planes versus naval or, or planes versus land or torpedoes versus naval or whatever, there are different rules for the way to, for how you apply hits. Um, sometimes the defender picks the, 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 where the hits go. Sometimes the attacker picks where the hits go. In the case of like naval stuff, you kind of designate your targets up front. Um, so it, it, but it does, and flak is another consideration there. Those aren't all in the same place in the book, and they really ought to be. Um, so I, we are enjoying Pacific War, uh, but we are struggling with that rule book. Um, I think that it is not as clear a rule book as I had hoped it would be. Um, Daniel says Pacific War is a nine. I, I'm not sure that it is. I, I'm not sure I agree. Now, again, you know, these are, these things are hard to quantify. So Daniel's nine might be different from my nine and that's, that's completely understandable and, and expected. Um, so I, that is not to say that Daniel is wrong. It's to say that, um, that it, it, it is going to vary by person based on their experience and what they are not even just experience, but what they're used to. And, Rule book la lack of clarity in the presentation can mask as higher complexity than the game actually has. Goss is a great example. It is not as complicated. It's complicated, but it's not nearly as complicated as people think it is. Um, but it, it the, the rule book is dreadful. The, the the old rule book, the rule, the new one's a lot better. Uh, the, the the rule book that is currently available from Decision and which is uh, the one that's in Lucky Forward is is like a huge improvement over even the last one, which was a significant improvement over the old one. So, so uh, yes, and with the new WIF was kickstart WIF Collector's Edition, I believe was kickstarted as well. That that's true. Stegler, I uh, there's somebody on BGG, I think that uh is reporting in on the campaign uh but generally speaking people are going we're we're now in the campaign scenarios and by campaign in your case i meant strategic scenarios uh which is the whole war right i'd like to try that actually but um we know i noticed something findle 70 thank you so much let me i'll get to your, your comment in a second i want to i want to respond to this really quick um before i lose track of the thought one one thing that I noticed is there's a lot of scenarios in Pacific War, okay? So we started with the engage, as I think is the intention. You start with the engagement scenarios, and then you move on to the battle scenarios, and then eventually you move on to the campaign scenarios, and then maybe you move on to the strategic scenario, which is the whole war. Um, so I found that at, at, at some point in the engagement scenarios, the game kind of... The, the scenarios were reaching farther than the, the, the limitations on the engagement scenarios were really allowing. And so then when we moved up to uh, the battle scenarios, I was like, wow, this is a much fuller experience. I mean, we expected that, right? But it, but it felt like it worked better too. And we're seeing the same thing stepping up from the battle scenarios. May, again, maybe we overdid the battle scenarios up to the campaign scenario. There's a lot to like there. And the additional complexity that you're adding going from battle scenarios to campaign scenarios is actually a very manageable leap. Now, going to the, to the strategic scenario, there's a whole bunch of extra stuff that it's necessary to handle the entire war that uh, that we may or may not get to. I don't think we're going to get to it this time around. Let me put it that way. Um, 
Daniel says he finds it easier to learn a world at war than Pacific War. There's a lot of variables there. I'll, I'll mention that. Findle 70. So uh, once again, uh, thanks very much. I do appreciate the support. Says, I seem to be able to absorb and internalize complex rule systems very well. He'd love to see some content around my process to learn those systems. Um, I'd love to say I am a genius, and that's why I, I am no problem with this. But the, the fact is, I have a great support network here in Central Ohio of people who play things like OCS and Europa and other games like that. And that makes it relatively easy to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd love to be the person who is responsible for that. But I'm I am cheating uh, by by living in a place where I have groups that support play of complicated games. Mike Anthony, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, I we are yeah we're going this we're doing FHA which is three and a half percent down so um, it's less than twenty percent down uh, has become unreachable for a lot of people right now because of where real estate prices are. Twenty percent down would be. Uh, yeah, a lot of money. Um, so, uh, but I do appreciate that. Thank you so much. We do want to get rid of the mortgage insurance thing, um, but it is a it is a manageable amount at this time. So I am not hugely concerned about it. We can always refinance later. I am. Oh, and the appraisal came in, and and as we expected, the appraisal came in uh, a little over what we are paying, uh, which I'm happy about. It's not under what we're paying. It's definitely not under what we're paying by such a large amount that we would have a problem with getting a loan for that amount. Uh, it's a little more than what we're paying. So, and, and, uh, the, uh, the appraiser has required that the seller fix a couple of things that I would prefer uh, the seller deal with and not me. So like cleaning up the debris and deadfall wood and stuff like that in the, in the backyard. So a grand, Oh, here's a great example, actually. Why is it? Because empire of the sun it is a great example because it is a game that I think we can say is a very challenging game for a lot of people to learn. Okay. Now, I've played it. I'm not particularly good at it, but I've played it. And and I agree with John. I don't think it's a particularly complicated game. And yet, why does why do people tend to think it's a really complicated game? And and frankly, I think it's the rule book. Um, I think it's 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 not as clear a rule book as one might hope. Um, it's not a monumentally complicated game. I think it's very elegant. In fact, um, there are some fiddly little rules here and there about certain things, but generally speaking, I think it plays really cleanly. Um, I think if you teach somebody to play Empire of the Sun, I think they'll get it very quickly. Um, but learning it from the book is a challenge. Um, and and I think when we when we talk about complexity as a as a barrier to getting people into role-playing games or not role-playing games a war game role-playing games too um i think a lot of times that's really what we mean is such and such a game is is you know it is not trying to be obtuse um and it's certainly not intentionally trying to keep keep the philistines out of the hobby but it is it is harder to learn than it might be from the materials that you get in the box um, I think certain publishers are doing a good job. Well, let me let me rephrase that. I think certain publishers are trying hard to advance the state of of war game presentation um, that I think we can all agree is maybe not as uh, good as it should be, right? Um, there's also the position that got taken in the thread. Pat took this position, and 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 I don't disagree with him. Is that people are going to play the things that they're interested in playing, and they're really less concerned about the complexity question than they are of am I interested in this subject? And I think that's completely true. Um, but people also give up sometimes. They also sometimes say, "Hey, I really want to learn this game. It looks really cool, but I just can't figure it out." Right? And people do give up sometimes. And that's unfortunate, right? There's also a lot of people that I've talked to that, who are these green guys? Um, 
The green guys are the Ottomans, which actually is a sensible color. Um, so... John Stanley, this is a great point, um, and the, the 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 reality of it is most. Let's not say most. Let's say several prominent war game publishers do not understand the value of the internet or what the internet does, or. Um, how to leverage the internet in general, not just YouTube. Let me put it that way. Uh, yeah, it, it's not that complicated though. Uh, and, and I think uh, we, we had, uh, was it Judd Vance that did like a series of vassal log files to teach people how to play the game. It's really not that complicated. It's complexity is very overrated. Or overstated, I should say. Um, there's also the get, getting back to this real quick. Um, there's also more of a cost to YouTube than people suppose because there's a cost of, of finding creators that are actually good at making content because not everybody is. So. Oops. Uh, so yeah, this is exactly this is exactly what I mean, Stigler. This is you know somebody's got to actually make the content, and you know I don't want to pick on GMT particularly, but GMT is not gonna like hire somebody to just do that, right? Um, they have somebody that's doing that, but that's either frankly a relative um, that's on the company payroll, or um, it's somebody doing it on a volunteer essentially a volunteer basis with maybe some some kind of consideration thrown their way from time to time so um uh jeff Beeler mentions uh so this is one example of an advance in component design that i think uh, a bunch of relatively well-known game series have used in the last few years. Again, these are the Ottomans. Um, so the uh, games that use uh, the, the track unit affiliation by uh, like colored stripes or something like that, that is something that we need or counter color or, or what have you. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, that's used a lot more now. And I'm trying to remember uh, which... Oh, Line of Battle, actually. Th th it actually is kind of on, on the counters for Line of Battle, but it's kind of hard to see. Um, so you really had to look at the unit designations uh, to, to you know, to kind of get a full grasp of what was what unit was affiliated with what regiment uh, or, or, or what regiment was affiliated with what uh, division, I should say, um, or, or brigade. However, however it worked out. So, uh, so I mean, then that's a big headache. That's that's one space where I think that the the component design of uh, GBACW is just flatly better than it is of, of Line of Battle. And I like Line of Battle a lot, actually. Uh, this is another thing. I mean, this is true, right? There are there are. Two, three, actually, if you count the alternate history Plan Orange as one, uh, Empire of the Sun mini games, uh, but those don't really simplify the game very much, do they? I mean, that Burma game has a big rule book for a magazine game. Um, it's just providing you with a with a more constrained decision space and less counters and all that. Um, it's not really much, if at all, simpler, to be honest. Um, they may be getting away with uh, leaving certain things out by not having aircraft carriers in that particular theater. So, although South Pacific does have aircraft carriers, but Burma does not. 
to my recollection. Uh, this is true, too, actually. Um, this is another one of those things. Unfamiliarity can mask as 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 complexity as well. Um, and Atlantic Chase is a good example because I, I look at it as a pretty traditional hex encounter guy and think, ooh, this, this feels weird. I don't know, man. Um, and the you really do kind of need to embrace its, its it rules presentation strategy. Um, and that those, those books, it's, it's one of the best developed games. Um, and I don't mean the design. I mean, it's one of the best developed games from the last several years that I can think of because it's so good at teaching the game and presenting its rules in a way that will be intuitive, not necessarily to the diehard experienced war gamer, but to the rando that picks the box up. Um, and I think that's, I think that's important. I think it's important to have those games. At the same time, here's another point that's kind of the other uh, end of the spectrum here. There is no lack of simple war games, right? There's no like union of war game designers who has it written into their contracts that they can't design simple war games. There's tons of simple war games released every year by decision of all people. You know, those folio games are all very simple. Um, uh, everything from Worthington is pretty simple, right? The stuff from Hollenspiel, which is not all war games, but a lot, a good chunk of it. Well, maybe not recently necessarily, but at least some of their output is war games. And a lot of White Dog and the Historical Game Company's games are war games. And those are all simple games too. Um, so there's like not a, a lack of, of simple games on these subjects um, either. And, and I, I, I am baffled when when we like forget that uh, to say that oh we need simpler games to attract newer people. Well, there's plenty of simple games now. We're not doing what we need to do to get those simpler games in front of the new people. Um, it, 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 to the extent that there is a problem here, right? Let's let's actually try and talk our way into identifying what the problem is, and then we can work out a solution to that problem. Uh, Revolution Games tends to be not terribly complex either, although that. Uh, uh, that um, do I still have it on the shelf behind? I don't think so. Um, the uh, uh, campaigns, of the American Revolution game that they have that's a bit gets a bit complicated. I I wouldn't call that a dead simple game. So stick with this is exactly what I'm saying. I think there's there's room for simple games and complicated games. There's definitely people who want to play simple games. That's absolutely true. John, John, you have mortally wounded him. Sergeant Deadhead, have a great night. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, there are also many games with a basic, you know, sort of basic and advanced rules, right? So the the Next War series from GMT, for example, is is one of those that has a really very simple uh, basic game to the extent that I think it's actually a bit uninteresting. Uh, and then a, you go to the advanced game, and it's like, whoa, <laughs> there's, a, there's a huge leap up. There's like an order of magnitude greater complexity in that advanced game. But it's really in that advanced game that the real juice of that series is found. So I feel like this question has too often become adversarial when asked um, or has been interpreted in an adversarial way. And, and maybe that means that the people who ask the question are as, asking it in, a, uh, in, in an overly aggressive way. And maybe it's true that the people who are, answer, who are getting defensive about it are overly touchy. That's possible too. Um, Lord knows I've had my touchy moments, but um, the, you know, uh, there is, th this is not necessarily a simple question, right? Um, one of the things that I brought up on the show with Dan, and we're talking about complexity tonight, but this is, you know, one of those barriers to wargaming is freaking marketing, man. Um, 
you know, GMT doesn't come to uh, Gen Con. Now, I don't know what it costs to be a vendor at Gen Con, but if any war game publisher could justify it, it would be GMT, and they don't. They choose to have their own little events, right? Um, they choose to not really have, I mean, I know they have their own YouTube channel, but I haven't seen a video on their YouTube channel in about a year. Um, they do very little with it. Um, they have very little social media footprint. Um, most of their marketing, if you want to call it that, is done on places where they are preaching the, the good news to the people who have already heard the good news, right? Apply on places like Board Game Geek and this channel and things like that. Um, they could be doing a lot more, uh, to, 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 not to say that, and, and everybody could, right? And it's it's not just GMT. I'm not, you know, they, it's easy to pick on GMT for this stuff. Um, just because they're, they're the biggest, right? Um, they're the biggest company doing traditional war games now. Um, they're the closest thing we have to Avalon Hill. It's very expensive to be a vendor at Gen Con, by the way. And a lot of companies like, like see that and, and decide they're not going to do it because they don't think they're going to make that number up in sales. Uh, but it's, it's really not about that. It's, it's really about getting your games in front of people, right? Um, and and GMT's been super supportive for like uh, the you know given prize support for the Armchair Dragoons and stuff like that. They're they're a lot of their prize pool comes out of GMT's stuff, right? They've been super supportive about that. But you know what if we had like a tournament at Origins that was GMT sponsored? We have Saint Twilight Struggle or Combat Commander or or uh, or whatever, right? Or or Commands and Colors, right? We could we could do something like that. And but it's it's all this sort of fan driven guerrilla marketing. Gone are the heady days of Avalon Hill taking out billboards for its war games. They have done this once or twice. That is true. I know they have worked with Rodney from from Watch It Played uh, at least a couple of times. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if that's paid up. Maybe that hasn't paid off and that's why they, they don't feel like it's worth it. That's, that's possible. Um, but at the same time, you know, you got to start somewhere, right? This is not even the best example, uh, of excessive complexity Francisco Franco has subscribed to the channel. Welcome, Francisco. So uh, I don't think OBA is even the best example of, of uh, complexity that has lost track of what it is there to do in ASO. I think there's a bunch of examples of that. I think the better examples are things like caves and uh, amphibious landings and stuff like that. I think... So I... I mean, this is me talking, right? I've got no inside information here. I'm literally some random dickhead on the internet spouting shit. I feel like GMT has overextended themselves, to be honest. And I think you can see that by looking at the P500 list of games that have made their P500 numbers, and yet there's not any real sign of movement getting them actually published. In some cases, uh, Thomas Bandy, thank you so much. In some cases, they have made their P500 numbers years ago and now sit at two or three times that number and there's just the pipeline's not there because the pipeline is not inside gmt the pipeline is off of the designer somewhere thomas bandy thank you so much um richard berg was a pretty good rules writer by the way um and wasn't afraid he was a lot of times fairly disorganized as a as a designer and as a rules writer um, but he also injected a lot of humor into his rule books a lot of times, and that helps, you know, uh, a, a lot of times kind of the expectation that we have in rules presentation is that it is going to be this dry and statistical presentation um, that is kind of hard to deal with. We're going to be able to fit the entire Ottomans in two compartments here. Would be actually have been good to use the uh, Aegis trays for this game, but I am out of them at this point. So 
So in, in any case, Thomas, excellent choice. SPQR is, in fact, an outstanding game. This is true too. If if you like have some, I get, this is true of almost the entire game in, of ASL. If you have somebody show it to you, it is really not as hard as there's a, there's a. It's still a really complicated game because there's a rule for everything, but everything doesn't come up in every game, right? So uh, the basics of it are not that complicated, and and it's relatively easy to teach people. Um, the rule book is not designed to be learned from. So that's a legitimate choice in terms of presentation. Um, but remember that at the time that that rule book was constructed, regular squad leader was still a thing. It was still in publication. So they Avalon Hill could and did say, hey, if you want to learn this game, go buy squad leader because it's got programmed instruction to teach you how to play this thing. Um, we don't really have that anymore, uh, but we do have the starter kit, right? Which, which does not really, it kind of, if, if you look at it at a macro level, it kind of does have programmed instruction. Um, but over the course of four different uh, SL starter kit box sets, rather than in the course of the scenarios inside the individual uh, sets. I mean, they, they kind of do that too. They kind of make a point to give you, Hey, here's some, Here's a couple of simpler scenarios, and then we'll work in a couple more complicated ones too. Uh, but it's it's not formal programmed instruction in the same way that the original squad leader had, where you were expected to play the scenarios in this specific order, and they would teach you these specific mechanics um, as you went. Um, so the ASL starter kit does that but it does it starter kit by starter kit rather than scenario by scenario i mean if anything detract well so narrative is i think narrative is more important than people tend to think it is right i mean narrative is one of the things that makes these things fun to play as opposed to statistical exercises performed by either professionals getting paid to do it or by incredibly OCD people. Um, not that we lack incredibly OCD people in this hobby. <clears throat> um, so, but I think narrative is important. I think it is something we generally want, even if it is not a thing that we identify as among those things that we want out of a war game design. Um, if complexity or anything else is getting in the way of narrative, then I think that is problematic for the design. Um, it's not just complexity that can do that. It is sometimes re removal of agency, right? It's, it's like, hey, I got this, uh, uh, and I'm going to pick on combat commander for this, is where, you know, we, me and my opponent both had five consecutive turns where we both discarded the maximum number of cards and didn't do anything um, because we had we're, we're drawing garbage cards. Um, so we are not too far from finishing this thing, by the way. I don't know that we'll finish it tonight. I'm probably finished after I finish the, the, hung, the Austrians here. Um, but we're making excellent progress. And if we don't finish it tonight, we will finish it next, uh, next week. Um, assuming I don't get anything clipped between now and then, and I do kind of want to leave stuff out to clip to, to do these shows with. Um, and well, I can always, I can always clip second front, right. Uh, or, or bust. I, you know, I know where the war in the Pacific box is. I could bust that out too. If I, if I really wanted to. So one of the things that I don't want to pick as a game to do on the show is a game with center nibs because I will want to cut those counters out of the sheets and that will give you guys this angle for like two hours and nobody wants to watch that. So yes, this is, this is, this does happen too, right? It's not, it's not that rare for shit to catch on fire in ASL. Um, so that is something that you do need to know if you're going to play a lot of ASL. Uh, but again, the rules are not necessary. If you're looking for like, how does this specific thing happen? 
it's not a badly organized rule book. It's 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 pretty well optimized for finding information. Uh, it's just not a good teaching rule book. Uh, Francisco Franco asks, first of all, welcome uh, to the stream. Um, thinking of starting Paths of Glory as the first solo game using Stuka Joe's CDG method. So uh, the Stuka Joe's CDG solo method was designed with Paths of Glory in mind. Um, so I will say, no, I, I think Paths of Glory is a, an interesting example in the context of what we're talking about here tonight, because while it's not an exceptionally complicated game, it's not that simple either. There's kind of a lot to it. Now, I have done several video tutorials on Paths of Glory, which are very out of date, and which I would like to pick back up at some point, but we've kind of lost the thread on that now. Nevertheless, a good chunk of the game is covered in my tutorial video, my three tutorial videos that I did, or was it four? I think it was three. Um, so a good chunk of the game is covered by that. Um, and honestly, Pez of Glory, if you kind of go through it and just play the game and look stuff up as you go and follow the sequence of play, uh, the rule book's decent. So, uh, it's not like you'll, you'll be like unable to find stuff in that rule book. Are we losing focus? Come on, camera. I think we're okay. I think my glasses are, yeah, they're pretty greasy. I, uh, fried up some burgers, uh, for dinner tonight, so. And I haven't cleaned my glasses since then. It's it wasn't that it wasn't that interesting, uh, Patrick. It wasn't that interesting of a story. That's the that's the problem. I can tell you that it was one of the Mediterranean scenarios. Um, and it was just, I had bad cards and he had bad cards and we just kind of threw cards away for multiple turns at a time. And it was like, man, this is not fun. Um, a lot of people love that game system and like the lack of control that it, uh, that it provides. Um, and I, I appreciate that that is a thing that it's doing, but I, but ASL does that too. Um, and yet I don't, to some extent, this is a skill a factor of scale right um because i might well lose control of a couple of squads that break in asl right and and i'm i'm re relatively restricted as to what i can do with those squads when um when they break but uh very few scenarios are so small that i'm gonna like have my entire force broken at a time um so i'll still have something to do and i'm not dependent on having cards to have something to do. I may, I may or may not be able to be effective that turn, but at least I'll have something to do. Whereas in the Combat Commander CDG model, at least, if you don't have the cards, you cannot do anything. And, and that sucks. You can run into that problem in uh, Commands and Colors as well. But interestingly, I have never really had that problem in Commands and Colors for more than a turn or two. I mean, sometimes you're not getting the cards you want, but it's not like I'm, I, I can do nothing because the cards, none of the cards I have are at all relevant to the things I can do on the map. Um, you, you, you don't necessarily have optimal cards, uh, but you have like, cards that will let you do something. So... This is true, too. Um, in many cases, and I've said this in various ways at various times in various videos, uh, I kind of require at this point that a game give me some kind of limitations on my ability to control the units under my command, okay? Um, because I think that's reasonable. Um, that reflects to the extent that, it, I mean, assu we're assuming a working mechanic here and not something that's just busted. Um, the it's reasonable that you don't have perfect control of absolutely everybody under your command, right? Um, it, it that is the way it worked historically almost all of the time. Um, and it gives you a decision space that can at least be similar to the historical decision space that the historical commanders operated in. And that's, you know, one of the things that we aim for in these games, right? 
is to kind of put ourselves in the shoes of a Patton or a Rommel or a, or a Napoleon or a, or a, or an Archduke Charles or whatever. Right. So. Now I, I will absolutely agree. I mean, and, and I am not trying to make the statement that co combat commander sucks. I am making, I have said numerous occasions that I don't like it, uh, but it has absolutely served as a gateway game for people. I mean, the, 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 the idea that there are gateway games that get people into the lar that expose people to the larger hobby is absolutely true. But what isn't true necessarily is that the gateway games are all these really simple games that are intended to be introductory. Um, it is possible for a, a complex game to be introductory. It is possible for a game to provide complex decisions without necessarily having rules that are, you know, similarly complicated. So, so that's a thing too. Um, there is a new fields of fire rule book uh, that I think GMT is now letting letting people look at and it is said to be a big improvement over the existing fields of fire rule book i have the first fields of fire um and it's a very well regarded game by those people who have figured it out it's a great example actually of a game that i think a lot of people would really like but which is being done no favors by its rule book which i believe everybody basically agrees is maybe not a great rule book at this point. Yeah. So Miss McFudpucker, the, yeah, I'm in a similar situation, except it's all still here. <laughs> um, we might be moving stuff to the storage unit, the, you know, and again, it's a pods type of thing. So the storage unit is in the driveway um, very soon. Findle 70 says that the new Fields of Fire rules are in closed beta right now. Yeah, they, there was an announcement about that in the GMT update. I think we might have missed the GMT update because I was offline last week, actually, but I guess we're not going to cover that. So it's all good. Brian Hard, first of all, welcome to the stream, who says, yeah, he had to muscle through it, right? And, and you know... I, I'd love to be able to say, I'll just suck it up and uh, muscle through it and you'll figure it out. Um, and, and that's fine. But again, people do get stuck and people do feel unsupported and they give up. Um, and I don't want people to do that, right? I, I want people to embrace the hobby. I want the hobby to have more exposure. There's definitely, you know, more people that we could be exposing this hobby to. Uh, Christopher Prest, if we're are we talking about GBACW? If if so, we're talking about GMT. GBACW is the Great Battles of the American Civil War. It is the game series that was begun in 1976 or 78 or whatever it was with Terrible Swift Sword by Richard Berg. Um, was further expanded by SPI. Uh, kind of went with Richard Berg to Conflict Simul. I think it was Conflict Simulations, uh, which I think was just him, pretty much. Um, there was a couple of games published by TSR, actually. Uh, Gleam of Bayonets, which is about Antietam. And there was Rebel Sabres, which was uh, various cavalry battles, including a, an expansion of Terrible Swift Sword. Uh, and then there was at least one and maybe two that they released in Strategy and Tactics. Um, and then Berg came to GMT with it with Three Days of Gettysburg, which is kind of the reimagining of Terrible Swift Sword. Um, there is a new edition of Three Days of Gettysburg in the works. There's So there's significant differences between the three versions of Three Days of Gettysburg that GMT has done. Um, and the one to get is the latest one. But frankly, the latest one still has some issues. Um, there are some relics that of things that were not cleaned up, like the like the types of like the river sizes are different on the terrain key than they are on the on the on the TEC. That's that's annoying. Um, there's not enough scenarios in even in the third version um, 
to some extent, the command system doesn't scale all the way down, but you could certainly have provided some one and, and some one map scenarios, and there really aren't any. Um, and that's unfortunate. Um, and contrast that with a game uh, like um, uh, Last Chance for Victory by uh, the gamers slash MMP slash Dean Essig, which is a magisterial package with like 20 plus scenarios in it of, you know, here's a, there's a wheat field scenario. There's a devil's den scenario. There's a, there's a little round top scenario. I mean, you get, you get all the scenarios um, of all the, the big, you know, narrative beats that happened at Gettysburg that we all are familiar with. Um, but that we just, you know, they're part of the larger battle that may not play very much like the historical battle because of the lack of relative command limitations in three days of Gettysburg. Um, so in a way it's kind of the, 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 the GBACW game that everybody wants to play cause it's Gettysburg, but in a way it's, it's, it's kind of the worst of the current designs in a lot of ways. Uh, the scenario selection is, is poor, um, you'll end up almost certainly will end up if you start on the first day you'll end up with a second day of gettysburg that looks very little like the historical second day um which is not true of last chance for victory so i am i am looking forward to uh, a, a another look and development pass at that game i think a lot can be done to improve it so, I mean, that was our experience with Three Dog. When we, we, I have played Three Dog, and we had a great time with it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the the game system, I mean, the 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 beats of the activations and all that, all work great. Um, but you got, you know, you're going to end up, I think, with some some a historical stuff just because of the nature of the battle. Um, in a sense, it's hard to simulate the battle at that scale because stuff comes in right and you're dependent on on the chip draws to actually enable you to activate units in an effective way and if you get boned on the chip draw and you know reynolds comes up late for example on the first day then it's it's not really going to be a disaster for the union ba just based on that but you're going to end up with a second day that's going to look dramatically different right uh, Christopher Prest asked for about starter game for GBACW. The best starter game available at the moment is Death Valley. Um, there are a lot of battles in it. I think there's like 12, 10, I think there's 10 battles, most of which have multiple scenarios. Those range all the way up from very small engagements like New Market, all the way up to, I think, second Winch, third Winchester, which is, which is quite a large battle. Uh, Cedar Creek is in there as well. It's the it's the Shenandoah Valley campaigns, the 62 and 64 Shenandoah Valley campaigns. And there's an expansion kit coming up, up too. Uh, McFud Puckers asking about the GMT 50% off sale. I don't know, but I don't have 50% right now to give them. So um, usually it's around the end of the year, though. I can tell you that. Boned on the chip. Yeah, but you're never, you're, 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 you're not. It's, it's not the same thing, right? Because you, you might not be activating the units that you wanted to activate right now, but you are activating somebody, right? And not nobody. You're not just sitting there. Well, I guess I'm discarding all the cards again this turn. This is fun. Um, it, it's, it's really, it's, it, there's a big distinction there, I think. And it can be. And you can always start on day two also. Or uh, Last Chance for Victory gives you a sort of post uh, Buford and Heath um, start two, where you could kind of start playing as Reynolds is coming up rather than the traditional Gettysburg game start where you've got Buford and he has a couple units on the map and Heath's walking onto the map with a few units. Uh, which is great for setup because you, you're you playing in 10 minutes, right? You put the maps down, you put the plexi over them, you get out 15 counters and off you go. Um, but it it, uh, it it does kind of take away. And it's actually, um, it helps you learn. It, it's, a, it's a good venue for learning, actually, if you're just, and I think that was the first time I'd played GBACW, actually, because you're starting with a relatively small number of units, a relatively small number of commands. You don't really have to worry about it so much. 
So very good, very good. Yep, Stigler's got the inside line on this stuff. He know, he knows what's going on. So very much looking forward to uh, to whatever Dick and the team come up with. Um, I do like GBACW a great deal. Um, the I think that's where I'm going to say. So I've got, and I'm not getting rid of it either. Last, I've got last chance for victory. Okay, which is again this sort of magisterially awesome package. But part of the reason for that is that huge scenario selection, right? And these this like entire book of historical notes too. Um, the th this is a great quest. This is a great question, actually. Uh, so there's nothing in Three Dog, to my recollection, that would force such a maneuver on on uh, Devil Dan Sickles' part, okay? Um, but if you don't have that, then you, again, that's another point at which if, if that develops differently, you might end up with a radically different looking battle, uh, which is fine, uh, but you kind of got to understand that. Now, in, uh, in Last Chance for Victory, there is a rule that's basically the Dan Sickles rule that basically says at some point, the Confederate player can write the orders, because remember, it's got written orders, can write the orders for a Union unit, and the Union unit has to obey those orders, um, which is, you know, it kind of covers the Dan Sickles rule, right? Now, yeah, yeah, there's a whole, I mean, I'd want like actual experts on the show if we're going to talk about Dan Sickles and how he, how he actually saved the day at Gettysburg, right, through that stunt. But uh, but there's a case to be made there, right? There's there is a case to be made that digging those guys out of their forward position cost the Confederates, the whole Confederate army, a lot of gas uh, that they then didn't get to spend elsewhere. I I think I think that you can make that point. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the end result is is th that they that the win loss on the end is not is not the same but but it could result in a radically different looking battle <laughs> no they, that's really didn't happen this is why asl civil war is a fucking dumb idea maybe this makes sense i mean there's reasons why sickles did that right and and as jeff touches on here he had had bad experience with that at was it chancellorsville um something like that uh time of crisis is an interesting design too uh, i just kind of sat down and played that with people and i liked it um but i didn't read the rule book so i don't know how good a rule book it is uh but it's definitely um it's definitely uh on the list of of games that i think can bring additional people into the hobby um in part because it, it is a radically different mechanical approach. So now on the other hand, okay, I, I really love the Dan Sickles rule in Last Chance for Victory. I'm not so fond of the John Reynolds rule, which basically states that sometime in this range of a couple of turns, he dies. Um, and if he doesn't die, then all the day one restrictions are lifted from Lee, um, which is a huge thing, actually, because Lee's inability to like issue coherent commands on that first day was a problem. Um, and I, I think that feels railroady, but it does end up with, I mean, remember it's the first day of a three day battle, right? So while you want it to vary from the historical, um, battle to some extent, you also want something that sort of looks like Gettysburg, right? And that rule does give you something that sort of looks like Gettysburg at least for two days. So I don't, I mean, maybe I wouldn't call this the same. I mean, it kind of is, um, but it's it's really uh, units attacking a fortified position or dug in position, which is something that happened in the Civil War. Um, so it, it's not the kind of, it, this it's not the kind of house to house fighting that we see pictured normally at, in um like a world war ii situation though no. 
and this is a great example, actually. Uh, and and to some extent, there there is some house to house stuff in there too. But uh, I think it's it's again not really what you picture if you think of World War II house to house and Stalingrad and that kind of thing. <laughs> Yes, this is this is exactly the point. This is exactly the point. Um, there were some Union sharpshooters at Gettysburg, actually. Uh, and and there's a there's uh, there there. Let's not make us too many assumptions about military stuff that worked in the Napoleonic Wars that didn't happen in the uh, American Civil War. There's reasons for that, right? Um, a, a big part of the reason for that is there's a lot more open space here, right? There's been people in, you know, if you want to talk about, uh, you know, Belgium, right? Let's let's talk about Belgium, the, the most densely part populated part of Europe for at least 1,200 years. Um, I have done the demographic research on that um, uh, for for uh, some stuff I was doing when I had access to Ohio State's library. Um, it is the most densely populated part of Europe by a lot for for uh, about 1,200 years, if not more. Uh, it's just that we have dicier information from prior to that. Um, so there's a lot more development, right? You had a lot more open space and people fighting in open countryside in the American Civil War. So. Uh, I think the supposition is that maybe a coordinated attack, such as Lee wanted Longstreet and everybody actually to pull off, uh, with you know that resulted historically in Pickett's Charge. I think that uh, might have a higher chance of actually occurring if they're not forced to fight over the the high ground that Sickles claimed. There's some street fight. There was a little bit of street fighting in Gettysburg, not much, um, but there there was a little bit when the when the um, uh, Confederates marched into the actual town itself. Oh, so anyway, oh, you know what? I have not even put up the banner for this week. Damn it! I forgot all about it even though I updated it all. So, I mean, yeah, how many fortified manor houses did you see on Civil War battlefields, right? So, I mean, and that's what those were. So... So anyway, that's, you know, complexity neither here nor there. But I figure we're probably about done talking about the complexity topic. I mean, I'll be happy to answer more questions, um, but I think we're good. So what do we got this week? Uh, I've gotten a couple of interviews do done um, of, you know, maybe less central stuff to the channel's theme. Um I'm trying to digest Mark, Mike Anthony's comment here that Lee had never left the enemy and controlled the battlefield. I mean, he did in the case of Antietam, certainly. Um, so when they, they, the Confederates withdrew um, and I, you know, again at Gettysburg when, when the Confederates withdrew. Um, so prior to Antietam, maybe not, but uh, unless, unless I've lost track of the conversation, which is, which is also pl plausible. Uh, I think Werner's is absolutely nasty, by the way. I don't think Canada Dry is very good either. I'd rather buy the, the hipster ginger ale that's got actual ginger in it. You can make ginger ale, and it's not that hard, actually. Um, well, so this gets into was, was an invasion of the North even a good idea in the first place? 
Um, I think there's a case to be made that it was not. Um, Lee's objective is to score a major victory on Union soil, which he tried twice and failed twice, um, or to destroy the Army of the Potomac. Um, that was not really going to happen. Um, that kind of, he was, he was aiming for a Napoleonic victory such as Jena Auerstadt. Um, and that just didn't happen in the American civil war. Uh, as somebody else pointed out, uh, Hood's army in Tennessee in 816, uh, it's 16, Jesus, 1864 was crushed very decisively either. Uh, but not, I don't think to the extent that the Prussian army in 1806, uh, 1807 or early 1808 was at in Auerstadt, where they were just de absolutely demolished um, and just tattered remnants remained. Uh, that 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 came kind of close to happening at Chickamauga, uh, but it did not happen in Chickamauga, thanks to George Thomas. Um, so, uh, John Stanley mentions Malvern Hill. Yeah, I've got to read more about the Seven Days Battles, actually. Uh, more importantly, I have to play seven days of battles games. Um, and I've already, I've already boxed other than these. Um, I've already boxed up all the GCACW stuff. Uh, even at the time, Washington had a bunch of troops and a bunch of fortifications in front of it. So Stegler, thanks for stopping by. Enjoy the game. And we'll see you again soon. So... The uh, Robotech, Robotech, not Battletech. I'm glad you like Marzi. Thanks. I'm I'm glad you liked it. Um, next, the next interview is filmed. I, it will require substantial editing, so I'm I don't want to promise it for Friday, but I'm hoping to have it out on Friday. Um, it is uh from a designer working with GMT right now. So um, and it is uh on a hex encounter game. So I think uh, folks watching will um will enjoy it. So. So, so yeah, there's reasons why this didn't happen. You can uh, look at the later raids on Washington, uh, Early's raid on Washington, for example. Uh, there's games on that. Now, that's 1864, right? But even, even in 1861, super early. And remember, you know, all green alike, right? So the Confederate Army was, was not really all that sure-footed either. And Lee had yet to emerge at that point. Um, who was in, uh, 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 Beauregard, PG, uh, Beauregard was in charge, I believe. So, uh, who was, uh, I think, uh, probably not well served by Confederate leadership. Let me put it that way. He was pretty good and, uh, did not, um, get the commands that I think he deserved. Christopher, I would I would encourage you to check out battle games, you know, maybe like GBACW, but also check out, if you haven't seen it yet, um, the Mark Simonich U.S. Civil War from GMT. You can also check out the Victory Games Civil War, but it's a lot more complicated, and I think that with the exception of the West Map material, which uh, is not really impactful to the conflict and which the GMT game just leaves out... Um, I think, generally speaking, the all of the virtues of the Eric Lee Smith Victory Games classic are basically captured in the Mark Simonich Civil War, uh, U.S. Civil War, but it plays about four times faster um, and is obviously graphically updated as well. So, uh, And it's available again from GMT, too. So that game is highly recommended. This is true. Um, uh, Yena was was so. I mean, this was how the 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 this was how a Napoleonic army destroying victory happened. Was you rout the enemy and then you run them down with cavalry, right? And and wreck the remnants. Uh, and this is exactly what happened in Yena and Auerstadt. So, so this is true. Uh, and the use of cavalry is very different in, in Napoleonics versus Civil War, too. So don't forget that. Um, cavalry charges, while they happened in the Civil War, were not the same kind of things that you saw in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, cavalry was much more frequently used to scout and screen 
um, then not that it wasn't used for that in the Napoleonic Wars too. Uh, but you, I mean, you remember you've seen we've all seen Waterloo, right? We've seen that huge cavalry charge. By the way, they're digging up um, the the Peter Nay, the school teacher from I think North Carolina, who some people feel was Michelle Nay. Uh, they're, they're they're exhuming the body and they're going to do testing on him. So that's very interesting. He probably is just some rando, but we will see. For the people, we'll give you a good sense of it, too. But frankly, for the people, it's considerably more complicated than I think than U.S. Civil War is. Um, it's a CDG, and it is a fairly fun. It's a great game, I got to tell you. But if you have for the people and not U.S. Civil War, you might want to pick up U.S. Civil War because it's, you know, it's going to be expensive again when it goes out of print, and it will. Um, <clears throat> and it's a hex encounter game, right, rather than a point-to-point -point game. But you get to see... Um, I, I think you, for me, I think I can see a lot more of the, the terrain considerations on a hex map rather than just kind of accepting them by fiat on the point to point map based on the paths that are available between the points. Uh, this is essentially true. And I guess you could say the, uh, the same thing about Armistead, but he's kind of the doomed guy too. So, uh, so there's that, um, there's, uh, I like the movie. I, I've got the extended version of the movie digitally and it's because uh, I don't want to buy physical media anymore. Fuck that. Um, but uh, Confederate Rebellion is, uh, looks good too. I haven't, I haven't played it that yet either. Yeah. I think, uh, other than the name, like the advanced naval rules for us civil war, I think us civil war is very simple. I mean, it's a hex grid. So you've got, and there's no, I mean, there's cards, but they're like, special action cards it's not it's not like a cdg right where you've got like a whole extra mechanism or a set of mechanisms uh for the cards and the ops points and that kind of stuff that you really don't have to deal with in u.s civil war um they're both really good games I, i'll unhesitatingly recommend them both i've got jeff davis as well uh it was part of my big like seven game white dog purchase from a year or two ago. Uh, this is um, so, I mean, this is how they fought at Gettysburg. Yeah. Buford's guys were just out light cavalry screen screening guys and they got off their horses and got the, got the uh, carbines out. Um, so, I've got Jeff Davis too, if I didn't say this already. Um, there's one of those. I think I bought one that you play. They're they're both solitaire games. One in one of them you play as the Union, and the other one you play as the Confederates. And they're other, they're not like by the same designer either. This is probably true. Um, but I don't want to fault Richard Jordan for that role because he was like literally dying of brain cancer as they were filming it. So Yes, uh, Wise Guy History is a great channel, which you should all be subscribed to anyway. So please go do that if you have not done so already. So. Findle 70, have a great night. All right, so what do we got happening for the rest of the week here? Uh, we do have Traveler Tuesday tomorrow. We have a look at Journal of the Traveler's Aid Society, Volume 8, recently ah, kickstarted from Mongoose Publishing. Our feature unboxing this week is Empire at Sunrise from Hollenspiel. There might be a bonus RPG thing, uh, but I don't know that I'm going to actually get it done. I would rather work on the editing for the interview um, for Friday, so... Yeah, and actually, I, I bought Jeff Davis based on the strength of Ben Madison being the designer, actually. Because um, I was initially dismissive of it. Oh, Jeff Davis, a traitor, traitor, son of a bitch. I should have hung that fucker. Um, but uh, then ben, I heard Ben Madison design the thing, and I'm like, ah, it's, it's probably good. So I, I picked it up. So. So what else do we got? Oh, so the if I haven't mentioned this, the merch store is back up. Um, I do have, um, I, I think, superior coffee mugs now to what we had before. 
Um, and there's a couple of new t-shirt things as well. So a couple of new t-shirt options. So, so check those out. It does help the channel. Uh, I don't see the money anytime soon, but, uh, cause it's Teespring and I, I did go back with Teespring, um, for a number of reasons. It's, it is the number one choice for a reason. If anybody has any problems with their Teespring orders, please let me know though. Uh, ardwolfslayer at gmail.com. I was thinking, and this won't happen anytime soon. Um, Oh, yeah, go take care of that, man. I have actually never had pork pirates in this area. Uh, and we are not exactly in the greatest neighborhood. Uh, we have had the cars rifled through. We've never had the cars broken into. It's always been um, if the cars are left unlocked, they go through the cars looking for change in cigarettes. Um, and they'll take the change in cigarettes and nothing else, pretty much. No, I like the. I just like the new one better. The new one's a black coffee mug with a light colored Ardwolf Slayer logo, where the old one was a white coffee mug, and I think it looks better. Um, two trucks. Wow. Okay, that's that's a lot of that's a lot of moving. We are probably going to need a truck in addition to the, um, um, in addition to the unit, uh, the pod type thing. Um, I don't think it's going to be big enough. Uh, but we kind of planned on that too, though. So <clears throat> it's actually not that expensive to rent a truck. And this way we don't have to rent like the maximum size truck. I just, right now I'm just sweating it out. I'm hoping that, you know, none of the things are problems and, and it'll all come through and that the, the closing costs, which we haven't pinned down to an exact number yet. I'm hoping that there'll be the number that they gave me the first time and not the sort of maximum number that I got the second time. Uh, cause if not, then I'm going to have to figure out how we're going to pay the closing costs. It's going to be close either way. Um, so, uh, but, but the help, uh, you know, I've gotten a tremendous amount of help in the channel tonight and that is much appreciated. So, uh, so I do appreciate that. Um, I have, you know, kind of not buying anything right now. Um, GTS Utah is probably the first thing that I'm going to pre-order once, once we get the move done. Um, it's really expensive, but I absolutely want it to. So uh, that's not even a question. Mm. Yes, Christopher, this is a great idea. It'll be a fabulous chip pull cup. Uh, unfortunately, I have games that require five or six different chip pull cups. Let's say nothing of whiff, which kind of requires about 30. So if not 70, so you really kind of got to use paper cups for that, right? I'm, I understand we're, we are, our anticipated close is on the 26th or 27th. And I'm hoping it'll be a little bit earlier than that, but not too much earlier than that. Uh, I'm prepared to close on the 22nd. So, um, and that's just cause that's when I get paid and, and uh, we'll have a, an additional, Ooh, see, we are upsizing into a size, a house that will actually fit us. Um, what's my square footage on that? Which, by the way, the appraiser measured that room as 11 feet. So 10.5 times 18.5. Yeah. 850 square foot man cave. That's huge, man. That's a huge man cave. Uh, yeah, I, I had to cancel the order because I just can't eat the 150 bucks of, of GMT charges on that particular date on July 15th. Uh, but yeah, I will absolutely be ordering that. I've been excited about that for years. Um, and it will replace the, my old shitty copy and uh and caesar in uh caesar versus gaul or whatever it's called as well so 40 4200 square feet's a huge house 1750 so the our new place is uh 2400 uh plus about 1500 basement of which most is not finished um so you know, it's, it's enough room for us. Let me put it that way. Oops. Oops. I'd be mad. <coughs> That's bad news. Huh. Oh, see, this is great. Yeah. We're moving from a nominally 1200 square feet, but it's really 700 square feet. Um, 
to 24. So we'll be good. And, we, and, and there's a garage and a basement and all that stuff. So, I mean, we have a garage, which has fallen down and a basement, which is uninhabitable. So. Ooh, there you go. There you go. So as long as I, I and my wife was completely on board with Gary needs his own space. Um, so Daniel, thanks for stopping by. Um, so, you know, happy to report that. And, you know, if this falls through, I don't know, I don't expect it to, but you, you know, you, you have nothing to do, but sit there and twiddle your thumbs for a week and a half and you start to worry about this stuff. Um, if this falls through, then we'll just, find something else in a few months. So uh, it'll be fine. Now's the right time, I think, for us. But so that's why I'm hoping it, it comes through. And it probably will. It just, you know, again, it's it's just we're, we're ooh, two bookcases. My wife has agreed to a, so right now there is a, in the house we're trying to buy, there's like two, there's like a great room, which has like a living room space and a family room space. I've always found that that's kind of stupid. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use that living room space, the sort of formal living room with the huge bay window as the dining room and put a really big dining table in there. And then we're going to use the current much, much smaller formal dining space um, actually and turn that into a reading nook, um, which is where the rather relatively small bookcase will go. Um, so we are allowed some bookcases, but I'm taking all the bookcases, right? All the Calaxes, even these shitty uh, Walmart bookcases, they're coming with me. I'll find a use for them, right? I'm going to end up building some of my own bookcases because that's just the way it's going to have to work. But um, I'm also taking all these with me. So we'll be able to develop a good shelf storage solution for war games and RPGs and all that stuff. Um, there's going to be, there's plenty of room for me to do that. So yeah, I don't think she's going to buy that. I don't think she's going to buy that. I actually, uh, have reasons to not prefer Calax bookcases. Um, I like Calaxes too. And for like those square box board that are really common in regular, like Euro style board games. Now they really fit well. The advantage to the Calax is that they're deep. So you can fit something like these games in there on their spines and they won't, they'll stick out a little bit, but they're not too much because they're 13 inches deep. Um, the, the problem with it is because they're those blocks, right? They're those 13 by 13 inch blocks. If you're going to fill up an entire wall with them, you're actually going to lose a lot of space because of the dividers between the blocks. Not to mention that the, the the outer like edges, the outer frame of the Calax is like an inch and a half. So you're actually going to lose a fair amount of shelf space over a large wall by using those. And if you don't have the room width, and I don't in that space, um, then losing that foot and a half, it's 13 inches, but you're probably figure it is 14 or 15 inches, um, is more, is more than I want to spend. So, uh, the shell, these shelves are not bowing as badly as you'd think they would be, to be honest. We're bowing a little bit here, even though these are all relatively light. The problem is these are cheap and shitty bookcases. These were $20 a piece on sale at Walmart several years ago. This, uh, this is the rigid shelf. So this one's not bowing as much as the other ones are, but this is the one that I'm actually, uh, it was a little worried. It's probably okay, but I, I was a little worried about it because it's all books on there, right? These things are heavy. So now, depending on your ceiling heights, you may be able to do something like Mike Anthony is describing here where you can stack calyxes and, and, and get, they're kind of high and you can get a lot of uh, a lot of games vertically, right? But you can do that with other types of bookcases too. You can do that with the, with the Billies from Ikea, uh, which is ones that I'm looking at, although they're they're redesigning them and I'm not sure about the redesign yet. Um, but I may just make bookshelves. Um, the office space, I am almost certainly going to need to just make bookshelves because nobody's pre-prepared bookshelves are going to fit exactly right. And I'm going to end up losing uh, wall space if I go with Billy's or, you know, Calyxes or whatever. So... 
you can totally do this. I've seen this done. I'm not doing that. Uh, this this is intended as a permanent installation, man. I'm not living in a fucking dorm. So I'm almost certainly not going to knock the wall out, actually. The space is... Once I realized that I could actually push one side of the tables against the wall, um, as long as I don't fill those wall, long walls up with shelving, um, that kind of means that I can get almost everything that I need to in that um, <laughs> in that room. So I, I think I'm not going to need to move the wall. And moving the wall would be a hassle because there's electrical in the wall. So this room has the the three by three. You can't see it, but there's a like like this is basically an attic, and there's a uh, the you can see the, the roof over here, and the three by three calyx is actually fit right right under that. So this ends up happening every single time. I agree. That sounds nice. That sounds nice. So we'll end up with some some built-ins in the basement. We'll see. We got to make sure that basement stays dry. I intend to soak some money into backup sump pump systems and that kind of shit in year one. So uh, there's two sump pump systems. So right right now, like I said, I'm just probably unnecessarily worrying about whether it's going to happen at all or not because I've been sitting here the whole weekend. I mean, I wasn't going to hear anything over the weekend, right? <laughs> But, but it does, didn't matter, right? It's just like, I can't do anything about it right now. All I can do is wait. So I've provided them with all the documentation and other nonsense that they wanted, including, you know, explanations of businesses that I did not own. So, all right, folks. So uh, stay tuned to the channel for other stuff as, as is being explained in the ticker right now. And um, we've got more videos coming. We have the show with Dan tomorrow night at 7 30 it is on dan's channel so check that out um i would love to thank everybody for coming out tonight um we have um let's pull this off here we gotta pull i wish wish it would not do that but it does so um i'd like to thank everybody for stopping by it's been a great turnout night uh we were up to like 135 at one point which is you know it's summertime people probably don't want to go out in this heat now um, but, uh, but we'll be back next week, right? You know, breeze line willing, we'll be back next week. And, and eventually I don't actually expect to miss a show for the move. Uh, if everything happens the way I want it to, um, that will not be necessary. I may not have like a pretty shelves behind me one night, but, but I shouldn't actually need to miss a show, uh, a counter clipping show for the move. So we'll see what happens. So everybody have a great night. Thanks so much for the support. And we'll see you all again soon.